Joy for my soul, peace in my mind. He is mine. He is mine. Yahshua, I know he is mine. Hallelujah. We're going to have everyone turn to a book in the Bible called Deuteronomy, chapter 23. And it's verses 1 through 8 is what we'll be covering today. This is a, a very interesting book. Um, and at the beginning of, specifically this chapter, chapter 23, there is a passage that on the surface seems very strange. It appears as though Yahweh is saying through Moses, because remember the law, they called the law of Moses, but it's Yahweh's law that he brought through Moses, right? But he's saying through Moses that certain people are forbidden from being a part of Elohim's people, the assembly of Yahweh. What's especially strange is that these people seem to be excluded based on their ethnicity or things beyond their control. Now, we just got finished singing a song about Yah Yahweh is our shepherd, and, and we shall not want, and, and how he leads me to this and that, and, he, and how he is mine. And, you know, and, and we know he's mine, but this, this scripture here has been used by many people to cast doubt on the character of Yahweh. So Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. Now, this is, this is very important that we understand this correctly because, remember, the law of Yahweh is his law, and he's good and holy, so the law is good. And the law reflects the character of Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, so we know that this, this is Yahweh's thoughts, and we have to understand his thoughts. So we're talking about, are these people... Excluded from Yahweh's covenant community. So, I mean, is this saying that eunuchs are not allowed to be a part of Yahweh's covenant community? Are men who get mutilated or who have some sort of deformity, perhaps because of a birth defect, prohibited in taking part in worshiping Yahweh? Now, let's look at verse 2. It says, no one born of a forbidden union, the Hebrew word for, for forbidden union there is mamzer, may enter the assembly of Yahweh, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants may enter the assembly of Yahweh. So according to scholars, those born of a forbidden union could refer to those who were conceived through cult prostitution, possibly those can see through adultery or incestuous unions. So we have uh, one such scholar named Dr. Daniel Block who says that while the etymology of the word is uncertain, linked to the preceding, this seems to refer to offspring of prostitutes who lived at pagan call sites. Moses' early, earlier warning concerning improper worship and that's in Deuteronomy 12. Moses talks about this, uh, 30 for 31. And the linkage of the 10th generation in verse 2b uh, with Ammonites and Moabites, also you'll see in verse 3, reinforce that, this, this interpretation. Since Israelites trace both of these people to an incestuous act. You remember the story of how the, the Moabites and the Edomites, you know, they came from the children of the daughters of Lot who had sex with their own father. And so Mamzer may, this is what Dr. Block said, Mamzer may refer to one conceived through incestuous intercourse. And we know that, you know, that's a prohibited in Leviticus, in Leviticus and Yahweh's law, 18. Incestuous, you know, you should, man should not be with his mother or, or, or daughter with her father. Or more broadly, one born of illicit sexual relationships. In other words, sex outside of marriage, you know, sex with your, you know, your, your mother, your stepmother, or whatever. You shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. So these are all things that the Yahweh's law tells you. Is, and these children are birthed out of these type of things. 
So now, that's, that's what Dr. Daniel Block has to say about the situation. So now, we know that children are not responsible for the circumstances of their conception, are they? So how does it make sense for Yahweh Elohim to prohibit such people from being full members of his covenant people? Is this verse really saying that these people are denied access to Yahweh's presence and his assembly? Wouldn't that be unreasonably cruel? Hmm? How many of you have ever come across this or, or, you know, verse or had this brought up to you before? I know I have, and I've had someone question me seriously about this. So because we're talking about being excluded from Yahweh's covenant community, his people. So this passage goes further to say if, that Ammonites and Moabites are likewise forbidden from entering the assembly of Yahweh, even to the 10th generation, which verse 3 clarifies as forever. Okay? So Edomites and Egyptians also are forbidden. But and we look at verse, you know, but they, they're only temporarily forbidden. Children born to them of the, in the third generation may enter the assembly of Yahweh, according to verse 8. So, again, do we understand that this passage is saying that certain people, that is eunuchs, and children conceived of sexual morality, as well as Amorites, Moabites, are to be forever excluded from Yahweh's covenant community? That's what many atheists and other critics of the Bible are asserting. There's an article uh, entitled, The Character of God in the Bible. It's a, on an atheist website, um, atheist.org. And, and they have quotes like, God shuns crippled people. Or they'll say, God is unjust. He punishes offspring who have committed no crime. You know, so, of course, Deuteronomy 23, which we, we're looking at, is cited as proof text of these assertions. Now, Internet atheists are notorious for misinterpreting the Bible. But many people who read this passage might think that the atheist has a point. You know? On the surface, it doesn't look like the atheist has a point, right? But, you know, they, they, you look at the Bible and they, they question, why is this in here? Why does Yahweh have this here? But at first glance... The passage could appear to suggest that Yahweh has excluded people from the covenant community on the basis of their ethnicity and, and circumstances beyond their control. If that's the case, that would be an understandable criticism. But there's more that we need to consider here that the atheists are interested in. You know? Because they, they have a predetermined bias against Yahweh. They're not trying to understand Yahweh. They're not trying to rightly divide the word for truth. So, they, so they, they're already coming in with assumptions, you know, and, and other critics, you know. But we, we know that Yahweh is mine, right? We know that Yahweh is good, right? Yes. And so we know that Yahweh is just in all his ways, right? Yes. So when we look at the Bible, we want to dig deep. We want to, and we want to see beneath the surface what Yahweh is showing us in the purposes so we're going to put all their little um, biased criticisms aside, and, and we want to study to show our interpretations approved. This is why to gain the most accurate interpretation of the Bible, it's best to interpret the Bible using the Bible. Amen? By looking at what the word of Yahweh as a whole has to say on a subject or a topic, the Bible itself helps to guide us in our interpretation of what Yahweh is saying. So let's let the Bible define the Bible and help us gain an accurate understanding, okay? So first of all, if Deuteronomy 23 is excluding children from Yahweh's people on the basis that they were born of sexual immorality, this would appear to be a clear violation of biblical principles that the word of Yahweh explicitly and consistently, that means continually over and over again, teaches elsewhere, okay? So, so let's look at Ezekiel 18. Hold your space there in Deuteronomy 23, but keep a thumb there, a, a marker, because we're going to come back to that. But turn to Ezekiel 18, 20, and when you get there, let me know. Say, I'm here. Hmm. 
Okay, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. It says, the soul who sins, this is Yahweh speaking through Ezekiel, shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father. In other words, children aren't going to be responsible for the sins that of their, their parents. Nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So children will be, will, will be punished based on their own sins. And, you know, not because of their parents and vice versa. So it's interesting that this passage in Ezekiel seems to be based upon a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 24, which is just a chapter after the, the current passage, Deuteronomy 23, which we're, ta we're talking about now, regarding exclusion from the assembly of Yahweh. Deuteronomy 24, 16, turn there. When you get there, tell me I've arrived. I heard one person say something. Was that it? All right. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, and this is right after, after 23. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. So how can this biblical principle be true if just a chapter earlier, Yahweh through Moses demands that children are forever excluded from Yahweh's people because of the sins of their parents. If you're excluded from Yahweh's people, that means you can't, you're not saved. If you're excluded from Yahweh's people, that means you're not a part of Yahweh's covenant people who, ha who can have uh, you know, their sins forgiven by the blood of the Lamb, who could, who, who could go to and experience eternal life you know, forever in the kingdom of heaven. That means that you, all that you look to is eternal death, right? So what, was Yahweh confused? Who, who th here thinks that Yahweh was confused? I don't see any hands raised, right? All right? So we know that Yahweh Elohim was not confused and that his word does not contradict itself. It is our misunderstandings of Yahweh's word that cause what seems to be contradictions. Correct? Amen. We must not create a whole interpretation or doctrine from one scripture passage when it, it comes to our interpretations. We should look at the context of the word of Yahweh, such as who is Yahweh speaking, or who is speaking in the, in the Bible, or who is being spoken to. What is the social, political, and spiritual situation surrounding what is being said in a particular passage? We should let the clear and consistent principles of Yahweh's word be the basis of general truth that helps guide and clarify us in setting a proper place where there's vague scriptures that we're looking at and we don't understand. The vague scriptures are not what determine the truth, Yahweh's truth. It's the clear principle where he clearly, explicitly explains things that determines and consistently you know, shows his will and his, and his way, reasoning, that determines the truth of scriptures. Okay? The, the vague ones are few and far in between. They don't determine our understanding of Scripture. Amen. So, there is still more to be considered here. Deuteronomy 23 mentions that the Moabites are excluded from the assembly of Yahweh, but Yahweh's consistent word elsewhere guides us to understand that this can't be broadly defined to mean that Moabites are never allowed to be a part of Yahweh's people. Amen? Why? Because they are welcomed among Yahweh's people in other parts of Yahweh's word. An obvious example would be Ruth, right? Uh, Ruth, Ruth was a uh, Moabite who is clearly brought into the family of Yahweh and even becomes a part of Yah Yeshua, the Lamb of Yahweh's genealogy. Amen? Let's, let's you know, if you look at, at Deuteronomy 23... And we see what Yahweh is saying. If he's truly saying that Moabites are forever excluded from being a part of his people, then Yahweh would not have allowed Ruth to have been married to Boaz and joined the covenant community. Neither would Yahweh have allowed Ruth's descendants, Obed, 
Jesse, and King David to have been born into the nation of Israel. Yahweh's own word obviously shows that to interpret Deuteronomy 23 to, you know, in the context of um, these people are not allowed to be a part of his people is not accurate. It's not consistent with what his word says as a whole. Amen? So Yahweh further says in Deuteronomy 23 that eunuchs are to be excluded from the assembly of Yahweh. But again, it is not accurate to interpret Yahweh here as meaning that they are forever excluded from being part of Yahweh's people. Why? Consider what Yahweh says in Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah 56, verse 4, and when you get there, say, I'm here. Isaiah 56, verse 4. All right. For thus saith Yahweh to the who? Who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, and hold fast my covenant, I will give you, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh to minister to him, to love the name of Yahweh and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for some people. Yeah, including the eunuchs, right? Right? All right? So in this passage, Yahweh explicitly, he's explaining clearly. He states that he desires eunuchs to draw near, to keep his Sabbath, and to bring offerings to his house of prayer. So eunuchs would fit within the category of those that Deuteronomy 23 says whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off. And thus, they are to be excluded from the assembly of Yahweh according to the way some interpret Deuteronomy 23. And yet Yahweh says in Isaiah 56, they are to be included in his testimony, his community, and welcomed into his presence. So you might also consider Acts 8.27 you know, and, and through 40, you don't have to turn there, but you should know the story of the Ethiopian eunuch who receives Yeshua as Savior and is baptized into the believing community. Amen? You know? So Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? He's, you know, so obviously Yahweh's word as a whole shows that the assembly he's telling Moses about in De Deuteronomy 23, which requires the exclusion of eunuchs, has a different meaning, which doesn't include them not being a part of his covenant community or not being able to draw near to Yahweh's presence and bring offerings to Yahweh's temple. You know, there's a different meaning to this assembly in Deut that we're, we're looking at in, in Deuteronomy 23. See, clearly eunuchs, Moabites, and others are welcomed and included among Yahweh's people. And why wouldn't they be? After all, the very covenant that Yahweh made with Abraham in Genesis 22, uh, 6 through 18, includes a promise that states, In your offspring shall some of the nations, all the nations of the earth be blessed, right? That includes the nations of the Moabites, right? That includes the, the Edomites, right? Right? All the nations. And that's the, what's the promise? The promise is if, through Yeshua, through the seed of Abraham, that they would be saved. They would be able to be his covenant people and receive salvation and be a part of his kingdom, right? And worship him. This promise precedes the instructions of Deuteronomy 23. Did Yahweh's plan to bless the nations, including the Moabites and others? through Abraham's offering, somehow changed sometime between Genesis and Deuteronomy? Of course not, right? 
Yahweh's plan to bless them did not change. You know, we can even we see that the gospel message, John 3, 16. What does it say? What? If you also love the world, then he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever, whoso, even Moabites, eunuchs, believeth in him, shall not perish, but have what? Amen. That's, that was the gospel that was beforehand preached, right? Yahweh Elohim later uh, designates this very promise of the gospel whereby the, the, the Galatians, I mean, the, um, the Galatians, he told Gal Galatia, the, the believers in Galatians, that the Gentiles would be saved. They would be grafted in to, into the believing remnant of Israel through Messiah. And he says this in Galatians 3.8. Let's turn there. And when you get there, say, I'm here. Galatians 3, verse 8. Okay, this is the apostle Shaul, Paul, talking to the, to the believers in Galatia. He says, and the scripture, foreseeing that Elohim would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, surely all the nations, again, include the Ammonites and the Moabites, right? Surely there are eunuchs. Uh, you know, and, and those born of forbidden unions among the nations, right? Who have been blessed through the offspring of Abraham. As we indeed have already seen, members of these very groups are not excluded, but welcome among Father Yahweh's people. So how do we rightly divide Yahweh's word of truth in Deuteronomy 23? So that we don't come up with our own inaccurate and shameful interpretation of Yahweh's character or what he's saying there. You know, how do we communicate Yahweh's true intent and what he's saying here in Deuteronomy 23? Well, the key lies in how we understand the phrase, again, assembly of Yahweh. The phrase is mentioned a total of six times, six times in Deuteronomy 23, but it appears nowhere else in the entire book of Deuteronomy. So again, the term assembly it means kiha in the Hebrews. Kiha simply means a gathering of people. Deuteronomy several times uses the term broadly in reference to the children of Israel as a whole. You'll see that in, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 5.22, Deuteronomy 9.10, Deuteronomy 10.4, and Deuteronomy 31.30. It's kind of like Sister Beth, she brought up uh, the, the word... Uh, Passover and what it can, and it has different meanings depending on the context it goes into. Well, do, well, this assembly can mean can mean Yahweh's people as a whole. However, as we've already covered, the word of Yahweh as a whole shows that the phrase "assembly of Yahweh" in Deuteronomy twenty-three one three cannot be referring to the broad community of Israel. Right? Again. That meaning would entail that members of the groups mentioned in Deuteronomy 23 are excluded from Yahweh's people. And as we've already established, that would contradict the clear and consistent word of Yahweh elsewhere that says members of these groups are admitted to be a part of Yahweh's people. So Yahweh's word as a whole shows that the phrase assembly, kihar, of Yahweh in Deuteronomy 23, 1-8, can, can have a more narrow meaning. Say more narrow meaning. The term kihal is used in a specific way in a number of places throughout Scripture. These occurrences shed light on what Yahweh in Deuteronomy 23 is speaking of. Now, the biblical scholar Dr. Jeffrey H. Tige writes this. Sometimes it, meaning kihal, in a very broad sense, meaning simply, it, it, it simply means all Israelites. But it also refers to the national governing assembly of the Israelites. That is, the entire people or all adult males, meaning in plenary, plenary session. Plenary is like a governmental session. And sometimes to their representatives, acting as a executive uh, committee. This assembly 
or conduct. Uh, oh no, this this is simply to conduct public business such as war, crowning a king, adjudicating legal cases, distributing land and worship. So this is by Je Jeffrey H. T. Gay uh, of the uh, Jewish. Uh, it says JPS Torah com commentary of Deuteronomy on page 210. In other words, Kiho is sometimes used to refer to a governing assembly of elders within the community of Israel. This governing body of leaders is given executive powers and the authority to make important decisions for the nation. Here are some examples. And we don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read them off. You can look it up, write them down if you, if you have a, a notebook. But in Numbers 16.3, it means an assembly there is, is talking about uh, of Israelite leaders confronting, that confronted Moses and Aaron. In Judges 21.5.8, the assembly is made up of arms-bearing adult males. In 1 Kings 12.3, an assembly... Uh, I'm talking about of Israel, comes before Rehoboam to choose a king. In Jeremiah 26, 17, and also Ezekiel 16 and, and chapter 23, an assembly serves as judges or adjudicators. In Micah chapter 2, verse 5, lots are cast in the assembly of Yahweh for acquiring property. Now, Dr. T.K. also notifies or notes that Kehal is synonymous in the, with the Hebrew word Ida, which also means community. Like Kehal, while Ida sometimes can refer to the entire nation of Israel, it's also used to refer to tribal leaders acting as an executive on behalf of the nation. And that's page 210 of, of Keol's uh, book. Here are some examples. In Exodus 12, chapter 3, uh, verse 3, Exodus 12, uh, verse 3 and 21, the community of elders act as executive. In Numbers 27, and also Numbers 12, the community of elders serve in judiciary matters. In Numbers 32, the community of elders function in allocating land. In 1 Kings 12, 20, and in 2 Chronicles 23, 2-3, a community of elders elects and crowns a king. With all this scripture evidence, it makes sense that the proper understanding of the phrase assembly of Yahweh in Deuteronomy 23 is that it refers to a governing assembly of elders who is given authority to make governmental decisions for the nation of Israel. Therefore, the law of Deuteronomy 23 regarding exclusion from the, the assembly are concerning that ruling body of elders. In summary, Deuteronomy 23 does not exclude members of the, the mentioned group from being a part of Yahweh's people, nor from being a part able to assemble together to worship Yahweh. It's not exclude, that's not what it means. But that still leaves us with a question. Why are these specific forbidden or specific people forbidden from becoming members of this governing body of leadership in Israel? Interesting, huh? There are many logical reasons for this. For why, for why Yahweh, in his infinite wisdom, chose to have people excluded, these people excluded, from the governing body. Since this governing assembly of elders had an important task to make decisions in the best interest of the nation, in addition to upholding godly values and fostering a stable society, you would expect that the qualifications for becoming members of this assembly would have to be very strict, right? It would have to be very high. So, so let's go through each of these groups and examine why they might have been excluded from this assembly of leaders. First of all, again, if we look at Deuteronomy 23.1, you turn back there. Again, no, it says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organs is cut off 
shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. Now, again, why would Yahweh say that eunuchs be excluded from this governmental assembly? Well, in the ancient Near East, ritual self-castration often occurred as a part of a pagan cult practice. Some pagan nations also use castration as a form of punishment, as we read in, in what is known as the Middle Assyrian laws. For instance, um, you know, Yahweh, he, he, he always wanted, uh, held a higher standard for people when it came to leaders, being leaders over his people. You, look, you can look at the qualifications even for the church. If you had some people who were married to more than one wife, they couldn't be a leader in Yahweh's people. There was a strict, there was very strict uh, reasons for Yahweh when it came to, um, to leaders having a higher standard than the normal people. Because, because they represented Yeshua, you know, and uh, they had to be perfect, much like the lamb that was brought, you know, to represent Yeshua had to be perfect. Amen? And so, so we see that um, Yahweh Elohim in Deuteronomy may exclude eunuchs from the governing assembly on the basis of the close cessation of castration with paganism. Another reason eunuchs may, Yahweh may have had them unable is the fact that they could not have children. And thus, logically, they wouldn't have as much incentive to govern with concern for future generations. Therefore, in his wisdom, Yahweh may have considered it important, I mean, imprudent and short-sighted to permit eunuchs to become members of, of this governing assembly of Israel. So we're going to move on to the next one, Deuteronomy 23.2. Number one, no one born of a forbidden union. Remember Mamzer. You know, sexually forbidden union. So they, they, they may not enter, they, no, none of them may enter the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the 10th generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of Yahweh. As we discussed earlier, you know, the, remember we're talking about why would Yahweh have those from a forbidden union be excluded from this governing assembly? Well, this, would re, this could, would refer to those who were conceived through cult, prostitution, adultery, or incest. The idea here is that those who serve within this, this governing body of rulers in Israel ought to come from stable homes, since the hope is that their decisions would foster a moral and spiritual healthy society. Amen? One of the, one of the decisions, uh, one of the leaders, um, one thing that they say, a leader of, of the church you know, has to be, be able to be able to rule his home and have a stable home. And so these are one of the things that could be why Yahweh decided to not let people born of, of those unions become a part of this leadership body. Move on to the next group. Deuteronomy 23.3. It says, no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of Yahweh. In this case, Yahweh actually goes on to give us the reason the Ammonites and the Moabites are excluded. It was their lack of hospitality and their hostility towards Israel when Israel passed by their territory. You know, um, it says here, again, even to this 10th generation, none of them may enter the assembly of Yahweh forever. Verse 4, because they did not meet with you with bread and with water, on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Belem, the son of Beor, from Pithor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. But Yahweh, your Elohim, would not listen to Belem. Instead, Yahweh, your Elohim, turned the curse into a blessing for you, because Yahweh, your Elohim, loved you. Verse 6 says, You shall not seek their, their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. So why would Yahweh have the Ammonites and the Moabites be excluded from this governing assembly? Since Ammonites and Moabites have proven themselves to be enemies of Israel, it would be, or it could be reasonably said that they wouldn't govern with Israel's best interest in mind. Thus, they are forever forbidden from serving in Israel's governing assembly of leaders. So finally, 
Edomites and Egyptians are excluded from the assembly of Yahweh, but not forever. So, you know, you remember um, Edomites, and, and um, they came, they, they're, they're come from way back to, um, they're actually relatives of Israel. And if you trace the grandchildren of Edomites, they, they, who have joined Israel, they, I think Yahweh permits them to, to eventually become a part of this governing body, their, their descendants, on the basis of, of family ties. And um, because it goes back to Esau and Jacob, they, you know, so they're relatives. So Edomites that converted to Judaism and, and came over to Israel and, and served Yahweh, they, you know, not the first generation, not the second generation, but the third generation would be allowed to be part of this governing body. And you have stuff like that, uh, and, 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 and I think in our country here, if you're a first generation from another country, you're not allowed to be president of the United States, right? That was the whole argument about President Obama. They didn't think he was born in America, and they wanted to see his birth certificate. Um, you know, because then that, that would have mean, meant that he wasn't qualified to be president of the United States. You know, and so, but we go on, and you remember Joseph and his brothers. Um, and, and Joseph was the second in power in, in Egypt, because it mentions the Egyptians. And how he welcomed his brethren in, and he took care of his family in Egypt during a famine. So the grandchildren of the Egyptians who have joined themselves to Israel are permitted on the basis of the fact that Israel was a sojourner in their land. That is, Egypt provided a haven, again, for Israel during the famine in Joseph's day. So look at Deuteronomy 23, verse 7. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, because... You were a sojourner in his land. Verse 8, children born to them in the third generation may enter the assembly of Yahweh. All right. So, of course, you know, when the Egyptians are, or, or the Edomites are allowed to be in, the, you know, in, in Israel amongst the people, but the, the people are not to treat them with abhorrence. Like, you know, Ugh, these evil, wild, wicked people, they're supposed to treat them nice. And their, third, and their children will be allowed to be governing. I guess the children will be acclimated to Israel and the laws of Yahweh. And, and maybe even some of them be married uh, you know, to Israelites and stuff like that. They will be allowed to join this governing body at that point. So another reason we know that the term assembly here is referring to a much more narrow definition than the larger general meaning of the assembly, which, which involves... Yahweh's covenant people, Israel as a whole, is because in Exodus 12, 37, you don't have to turn there, but it's, that's the story when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they brought with them a mixed multitude, right? A first generation foreigners, people, which included Egyptians, who had joined as a part of Yahweh's people of Israel as a whole, but whose family members would, would not, according to Deuteronomy 23, be qualified to be a part of the governing assembly of leaders until the third generation. So, in summary, when you've, gather, when, when you've gathered and put together all the evidence of Yahweh's word uh, as a whole, the Bible shows the, inter the proper interpretation of Deuteronomy 23. The assembly of Yahweh refers to a governing body of elders. And so, does that make sense, people? Yes. yes. So I want you to have an answer for these critics and atheists that wants, want to blaspheme the Elohim that we serve, the Elohim that, that we trust is good and righteous in all his ways, and they want to use the Bible against them with their uh, uh, surface interpretation. Now, there's one argument that could be brought up against this interpretation, and that is David was a descendant of Ruth, a Moabite. And David, of course, governed Israel as a king, right? So wouldn't David, as a descendant of a Moabite, be excluded forever from such an office according to the law of Yahweh in Deuteronomy 23? Wouldn't this therefore be a contradiction of Yahweh going against his own word? Hmm. Is that a good argument? Huh? Hmm. Well, there are a few ways we might answer this argument. First, 
we need to know that this objection could be raised with regard to any interpretation you choose. In other words, if you, if you interpret Deuteronomy 23 to mean the assembly of Yahweh in general, then, you know, is, it, it, they're, they're, that's, that's talking about Yahweh's people as a whole. Then David wouldn't fit that either. He couldn't be a part of Yahweh's people as a whole. He couldn't be even a member of Israel. Okay? All right? So if you interpret that um, they couldn't be worshiping in the temple or bring offerings to the temple and draw nigh to his presence, David, would, you know, wouldn't be able, he, he, he was a worshiper. He was someone that loved to be in the house of Yahweh and to worship in the temple and brought offerings. So, that, so he would present problems no matter what interpretation you want to take. Okay? So but obviously, David, as a qualif he, you know, he, he, as king, he was a qualified ruler and worshiper in the tabernacle of Yahweh. So, so how do we reconcile this issue? David was a descendant of Ruth, a Moabite, and David, of course, governed Israel as a king. So in the ancient Near East, nationality was decided by the father, okay? Fatherhood decided your nationality. Not your mom could be a Moabite. Your mom could be an Edomite. But if your father was an Israelite, then you were an Israelite, okay? All right, does it make sense? Apparently, Yahweh Elohim agrees with fathers deciding, the, you know, the, the children's inherit, you know, the, the ethnicity. Okay? So with this reasoning, any of Ruth's descendants would, through Boaz, who was an Israelite, have been considered natural-born Israelites. All right? Through patrimonial descent, you know. David was legally considered an Israelite and therefore would have met Yahweh's qualifications of Deuteronomy 23. And that includes Yeshua, the king of Judah, you know, the lion of Judah who was a descendant of David and also a descendant of Ruth. What do these laws mean for us today? Okay, well, you know, a lot of people, you know, the laws are done away with, especially popular Christianity and stuff. Now, we don't believe the laws are done away with. We believe that the lo there's laws that cannot be applied today because we don't have the proper context in which to apply those laws, you know, right now, you know, See, these laws are to be applied only within the context of a theocratic governed earthly nation of Israel. A theocratic means Yahweh directly rules over an earthly nation or government. It's his government. We, don't, we live now in a nation that is not a theocratic government. A theocratic government is a government for Yahweh, by Elihim Yahweh. We live in a, in a government that's supposed to be for the people, by the people, right? All right? So, as we've seen, the assembly of Yahweh literally refers to a ruling body of elders chosen by Yahweh to assist Moses in leading the nation. The elements, you know, that frame, or the framework that would be necessary to observe these laws of Deuteronomy 23 don't exist in our current situation. Now, um, maybe when Yeshua comes back again and he's ruling his government, over the whole world, these elements will fall in place again. Malachi talking about, uh, and we won't turn there, but talking about Yeshua's return during the millennial reign, it talks about remember the law of Moses. So a lot of this kind of ruling, because Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever, may come back again. But right now, we're, we don't have the situation to apply those, those laws. So these commandments... Uh, can literally apply to us, you know, in, those, in that situation, um, you know, that, that when, when, you know, if we were in a situation where earthly Israel, if we, you know, uh, we had a theocratic govern, government ruled by Yahweh, directly by Yahweh, but this will not happen again until Yeshua maybe comes back again in the near future or whenever he comes back, that won't be the case. But that we can use the principles of this in other situations as we learn from what Yahweh is trying to teach us. It's like right now, we live in a country where we vote people and leaders into, into office, right? And um, notwithstanding Sister Cynthia, she, she, said, she said that basically, is, you know, there is no political answer to, for, for what ails the world or in this country. 
It, it's, the, it's all about Yeshua. Amen? One heart at a time. So, but we can still learn, you know, even though we live in the Western world, that leadership, we should want leadership that is held to a higher standard. Amen? You know, and who has a Bible? Lift up your Bible. That is the higher standard that leadership should be held to. Amen? We don't want leadership as we spoke of in Beth's class. We talked about the, the office gifts. We don't want leaders that are after money and filthy, filthy lucre, right? We don't want leaders that are, that are greedy for money and all that stuff like that. We don't want, you know, leaders that are, have a, a, a history of corruption. And we, don't, we should not want to vote those people in uh, or who, leaders who have policies that wouldn't nurture a moral or stable society. We wouldn't want to promote those type of leaders. And so that was one of the reasons why Yahweh excluded certain peoples from the assembly of Yahweh. You know, we can also apply these principles to a congregational setting, right? To the church, as, as, as I already mentioned. You know, the, the qualifications of church leaders, which you can find that, in, you don't have to turn there, in Titus chapter 1, 6 through 9. You know, uh, according to the apostles, congregational leaders are to be above reproach. Again, not lovers of money. They are to have stable families. They are to be concerned with the needs of, of their community and such. If a congregational leader is dishonest or shows consistent patterns of shady behavior, that person needs to be held accountable, right? And probably removed from leadership for the sake of the body, you know? What, so what does these laws mean for us today again as we think about it? Well, just as the governing assembly of leaders in Deuteronomy 23 was held to a higher standard, congregational leaders ought to be also held to a higher standard. In, in Yahweh's kingdom, that's the case. We are as leaders, Beth, Jeremiah, Mama D, you know, you know we are held, and, you know, all of us, you know, are held to a higher standard. Okay, ultimately, that's what Deuteronomy 23, 1 through 8 is teaching us. Our civil and spiritual leadership, which, which in Israel overlapped, right? There was no separation of church and state. It was all, this, all together. Ought to be held to a higher standard. And again, what's the elder standard? Read your Bible. The word of Yahweh. Amen. They ought to have the community's best interest in mind. To make important decisions, they ought to be concerned with fostering a healthy and moral society. There was, there was a law in this country, even though, you know, under the old, the old uh, uh, people of this country, they say this country was built uh, one nation under God, but there was a rule that you could not be elected to office unless you were a Christian. You know? I mean, yes, you can worship Buddha, you can come to this country, worship any gods and religion you want, but make no mistake, this was supposed to be a Judeo-Christian nation based on Judeo-Christian principles. We've allowed the foreigners that, you know, to come over with their gods and stuff to take over our government, take, want to take the Ten Commandments off, out of the court walls, want to take God out of everything. And so, but that's not the, originally what it was for. You, you could come here and worship whoever you wanted to according to this country, but you could not take away our, our basis, which was supposed to be based on the Judeo-Biblical values. And so, unfortunately, maybe we should have um, been like a theocracy, theocratic nation like Israel, and we wouldn't have been overtaken because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that's what happened. And that's why it's so important to, for leadership to be strict and not liberal in, in allowing these influences to come in and take over the nations. Yahweh bless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.